78 days. For 78 days, the Canadian army and the Ganyenga Haga faced each other down over the barricades as riots broke out and as protesters marched across the country and a man died among the pine trees of Ganesatage. And all of this for the expansion of a golf course. So I remember as a young kid talking to my grandmother about the countries of the world and how some of them had done terrible things. At the time, I didn't really know what terrible things meant. I must have been like eight or nine and I had a kid sense that sometimes countries could be bad. Being British, she brought up the United States, of course, and Germany during the war, which she had lived through. I think she even conceded <gasps> that the British had not been entirely perfect. I know, I know guys, come on, she was old. Anyways, after going on like this for a while, Canada came up, or rather, I brought it up. It was sometimes hard to get a word in edgewise. Anyways, she said that Canada hadn't really done anything bad, and if it had, it was really on the British. Canada did nice things like peacekeeping and speaking French, nothing really bad. We were the world's nice guys. Everybody likes Canadians. But what does that mean though? being the nice guys. In other words, what does it actually mean to be Canadian? Yeah, we're really going there. When you ask the average English-speaking Canadian, francophone opinions vary much more widely, what does it mean to be Canadian, you'll usually get the usual string of cliches. Maple syrup, poutine, how nice and polite Canadians are. Maybe a moose or a canoe are thrown in for good measure. The deeper cut though, if the person has spent any amount of time thinking about the question, is the now tired opinion article of how it doesn't mean anything actually to be Canadian. At least nothing substantive. We are, apparently, a nation without culture. At least not a unifying one. There is no there there. What you'll rarely get, if ever, is a mention of history, of events that created a national myth. Sometimes Vimy Ridge is cited, but nobody can tell you what Vimy Ridge was for, it's just that it was a Canadian moment somehow. The school child idea of Canadian history, and as a high school history teacher, I know, is that history is just boring. And it's this basic truism that follows most people into adulthood, if sometimes lightly frosted with nostalgia in old age. The consequence is a void where a story should be, where history should be. And so an acceptance of syrup and gravy on fries as identity. And you know, I don't really wanna tell you here that those things don't matter, that you shouldn't think of Canada as meaning those things. I frankly just don't care about them. Well, I do care about canoes actually, yeah. Yeah, canoes are good, canoes are fine. What I do care about is the idea of emptiness, of meaninglessness for Canadian identity. We're the great white north, but that's just a direction and a color. Not even a color, it's not exactly an identity. And you might say, well, that's fine. It gives space to more substantive cultural identities to form part of the cultural mosaic that is Canada. Leaving aside the political complexity of that idea, and actually comment in the description if you'd like me to talk about that, the fundamental problem with the idea that there is no real substantive Canadian identity is that there is a very concrete history, a very real story of Canada, which is today, whether we like it or not, forcing us to confront what Canada has meant for a lot of people. Canada has been awakened, the words of a residential school survivor today, as the final report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was submitted. What took place in residential schools amounts to nothing short of cultural genocide. And after hundreds of unmarked graves were found at the site of a former residential school for Indigenous children. Both of these recent cases have re-exposed a deep rift between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in Canada. It's a divide that goes back hundreds of years. 
I'd argue that this lack of an identity, at least in the context of indigenous people, has allowed us to forget the original sin of this country, and time and time again has formed the basis for continuing the cycle of injustice. Reading accounts of the 270 years of resistance at Ganesa Tage, I was struck by how the white people seemed so surprised that this was still a problem. And that's a problem. Going back to the 90s, a period Francis Fukuyama famously described as the end of history with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the defeat of communism, the lives of indigenous people seemed pretty remote to me in suburban Ottawa, where I grew up. White people, not all, I suppose, believed that indigenous people were a conquered people, on their way to assimilation. And frankly, it would be better for everyone if they just got on with it. But this was not the end of history for them. In a sense, it was a late stage of a new beginning, as the reality of what was going on in the background of the 1990s and earlier couldn't have been more at odds with that idea. And as a consequence, today, in view of what was happening then, we are faced with a question, a real question, about not entirely what Canada has been, although that's a big part of the equation, but what Canada should be moving forward. We as a generation of people are faced with a great constitutional question. What should the right relationship be between Canada and Indigenous people? And I can't stress enough that that is what is at the core of any news articles you may be reading or stories you might be hearing on the radio or videos you might be watching on YouTube. What the future of Canada will be what it means to be a Canadian is being decided today and tomorrow and in the years to come. And so today, I want to invite you into that conversation about where we're going and what kind of country this is going to be in 5, 10, 20 years. And I have to say, these are exciting times to be living in. There's a lot of wrong going on, and frankly, too much injustice, both now and in the past. It's unequivocally true. But there's also a lot of possibility ahead of us. It's unquestionably long overdue. But we have the responsibility, and in fact, the good fortune to be born at a time when we can meaningfully make progress on this fundamental aspect of who we are as a country. Strap in. Because today, I want to talk to you about the Oka Crisis. One morning in mid-July, Joyce Nicholas was making pancakes and coffee at her home in Oka, Quebec near Montreal to bring up to a group of protesters manning a barricade just off of Highway 344. These people at the barricade were Ganyenga Haga, known commonly as Mohawks. They had been, for three months, protesting the expansion of a golf course into their territory of Ganesatage, known as the Pines. The pancakes and coffee Joyce was in the process of preparing would never reach them. Instead, as she stepped out onto her front porch, she saw dozens of police cars and rental trucks making their way toward the barricade. She went right back inside, jumped on the phone, and let the protesters know. By quarter past five, the Sûreté Québec, or the SQ, the Provincial Police Force of Quebec, arrived at the small barricade and ordered it to be dispersed. After a few attempts to delay the officers, they began to lob tear gas canisters over the barricade. What happened next isn't entirely clear. Was it the police who shot first, or the Ganyenga Haga? Both claim it was the other side. Either way, the wind was turning back the gas toward the SQ officers. And in spite of the fact that they were wearing protective gas masks, panic ensued. And after 22 seconds of semi-automatic rifle fire, 31-year-old Corporal Marcel Lemay was left fatally wounded. The police officers scattered, leaving behind vans, police cars, and a front loader meant to dismantle the barricade. The Genyenga Haga, as much surprised by the turning of the tides as the SQ officers, nonetheless seized the moment. Driving the front loader out onto Highway 344, they quickly erected a new, larger barricade. It was built from felled trees and 
the abandoned police cars of the SQ officers. In solidarity with their brothers and sisters at Ganesatage, the Ganyenga Haga of nearby Ganawage would also seize the Mercier Bridge, an important commuter artery leading into Montreal. As the Ganyenga Haga see it, the 78-day invasion of their territory, known as the Siege of Ganesatage, had begun. It is more commonly referred to today as the Oka Crisis. But how did we get here? Harry Swain wrote about his work as the Federal Deputy Minister of Indian Affairs in 1990 that contemporary events have 200-year-old trails. And this was definitely not only the case with the Oka Crisis, but looking at these 200-year-old trails provides us with a useful case study in Canada's relationship with Indigenous people. It all goes back to the early 18th century, 270 years before Oka. And the decision by a small group of Ganyengahaga, remember, that's the actual name for Mohawks, to consent to moving from Montreal to a place where the Ottawa River spills into the St. Lawrence Seaway. If you check it out on a map, it's actually a fair distance from Montreal. And so the Ganyengahaga only consented to this move because they were guaranteed to receive a deed from the king. Oh my god. And wouldn't therefore be forced to move anywhere else ever again. Since the arrival of the French in what they called New France, this particular group had been shunted around all over the place. This was a way to put an end to that uncertainty. These lands were to be, in the words of Philippe d'Orléans, the king's regent, a home for the Indians. Yeah, I know, it's what they said back then, okay? A home for the Indians, as long as they wanted to live there. They called their home Ganesatage, or the place where the crusted sand dunes are. Now, we should just take a moment and recognize that it's kind of weird that Philippe d'Orléans was able to do this in the first place, right? Because the spot was actually already an established hunting ground for this particular group. Why would they just accept being given what they had been used to using for generation? What was already theirs? Obviously, there's that whole stability thing, but it goes deeper. And, you know, Understanding why this relationship started out this way is really the first step in understanding what actually happened between indigenous people and Europeans and what continues to generate confusion and, for obvious reasons, mistrust. Put in the simplest terms, and perhaps overly kind terms, you have a different set of cultural attitudes toward the land. For indigenous people, land ownership well, it wasn't actually a thing, at least not as we understand it today. It was more about a responsibility to the land, to care for it as it cares for you. Furthermore, the Ganyenga Haga, as members of the larger nation of the Haudenosaunee, ascribed to the seventh generation principle, whereby all decisions must take into consideration the impact that those decisions might have seven generations from the time of their being made. In contrast, for the very hierarchical and Christian Europeans, the concept of private or personal ownership was a thing. This land is mine and not yours, and insofar as it is mine, you have no right to it. Moreover, I can do with my land whatever I want. This kind of thinking would come to form the basis for modern capitalism, and many folks actually see the discovery of the new world as kickstarting capitalism. Anyways, that's all well and good, but since the Ganyenga Haga had been using that territory as a hunting ground for a long time before the French arrived, wouldn't they have a better claim to that land? Well, not according to the French crown. And the reason why comes down to what is known as the doctrine of discovery. It's possible that you've heard about this before. It was a big deal when the Pope visited Canada to issue an apology to indigenous people because a lot of folks were calling on the Pope to rescind the doctrine of discovery. It was ultimately something that was established by papal declarations called papal bulls. Pope Francis did not rescind the doctrine of discovery. And whatever you think about the justice of his decision not to do so, it's plain to see why for someone like him, doing so would be a bridge too far. 
So if you've ever attended high school in North America, you might have heard of the Age of Discovery. In the simplest terms, it's the period following the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Turks, which in effect cut Europe off from the lucrative trade routes to China. Europeans wanted the out of the spices and silks, so luxury goods, which came from China. What they didn't want to do was to pay super high markups on it. And so, starting with Portugal, they set out on an epic quest to find silk and spices. In 1492, this resulted in the discovery of the New World by Christopher Columbus. So yes, scare quotes on discovery. I think it's almost at the point of a cliche now, or at least should be, to say, uh, but like, what about the people living there? And yeah, that's a pretty big inconvenient truth of this so-called discovery, right? Some folks <sighs> want to get all deep about it, and they say, well, uh, like, they discovered it for Europe, you know? Like, now the rest of the world knew about America. But actually, in saying this, they do get to the core of what the doctrine of discovery is. Just maybe not for the reasons they think. Which is to say that the doctrine of discovery is not just some silly thing that Europeans thought they had done, but actually hadn't. Like how we use the term Indian for centuries, knowing full well that this was not India. Where do white supremacists get this sense of confidence? The doctrine of discovery is a specific, targeted legal framework by which the rights of indigenous people to their land are simply waved away. Not, I should stress, by indigenous people, but by Europeans. And what was the basis for this? Cultural superiority. Now, I don't want to freak you out by this next term, but this was literally white supremacy. The doctrine of discovery is based on the idea that white people possessed a better sense of truth about the world, so much so that their mere arrival in North America immediately disinherited the people who were already living there. If you're wondering what truth we're talking about, guess. It's, it's, guys, it's Jesus, guys, it's, it's Christianity. They, they, they were Christians. It was, it was because of Jesus that they got to have everybody's stuff. Columbus famously described how nice the Taino people he discovered were, and how, accordingly, they would make great slaves. In Canada, indigenous people were described as simple or naive or, more often than not, the much more offensive sauvage, which literally means wild. In spite of the relationships that the French built with indigenous people, these were not people to them. They were, for all intents and purposes, animals, parts of the landscape. Okay, so why wouldn't the Pope want to disavow a policy which was literally white supremacist. Well, folks, because all law in Canada, at least as far as it relates to property, goes back to the doctrine of discovery. Lands here are guaranteed by the crown, i.e. the British monarchy. By some interpretations, even private lands are held of the crown. Regardless, even today, only 11% of Canada's land is held privately. The rest is crown land. And so, for the Pope to rescind the doctrine of discovery? Well, Canada would have to sort out some pretty important aspects of the Constitution. Whatever you want to say about Canadians' present claims to the land, I think that reckoning with the doctrine of discovery and its place at the foundation of what Canada is, is something we really need to get on. Okay, so how does this relate to Ganesatage and our friends, the Ganyangahaga? Well, in 1716, since Jacques Cartier claimed discovery of New France back in 1534, these lands, whether inhabited for 10 or 15,000 years, were legally speaking, crown lands. The king could and did do with these lands whatever he pleased, and all of this would form the origin point for the Oka crisis. But wait, Philippe d'Orléans was supposed to have 
given the land to the Genyenga Haga for their use slash benefit, if at the pleasure of the king. Well, they are still there today, so promise kept? Well, not quite. You see, there was a little bit of a catch. The Ganyenga Haga were not given that land. That would be too simple, right? Much too straightforward. And we're talking about the period of Byzantine, Ancien Regime, France colonizing North America. But you knew there was a catch already. Well, the deal was this. Your community is going to be a mission. That is, the Parisian Catholic Order of the Sulpician Monks are going with you. And they are going to get a really tiny, itsy bitsy, don't even worry about it, little tiny sliver of a territory right next to yours. <sighs> but it's going to be great, tremendous. They are just going along to tend to your souls and make sure that you get right with God. Totally in your interest, no big deal. Now, the reality at first wasn't all bad. Philippe d'Orléans did specify at the time that the Sulpicians had precisely zero claim to the three leagues of territory being granted to the Ganyenga Hug. Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. And another important facet of indigenous people's relationship with colonial states started to play out pretty much right away. You see, the simple fact of the matter is that the Sulpicians were French and the Ganyenga Haga were, well, they were the Ganyenga Haga. This meant that the Sulpicians had a much higher level of access to the power that was making the decisions. And right away, they began to exercise the power that came with that access by muddying the waters. You see, as a mission, the Sulpicians would be responsible for tending to the souls of the inhabitants of Genesatage, which meant in practice convincing them to leave behind their traditional spiritual beliefs in order to adopt Catholicism. Problem was that spending all of your time thinking about and talking about God meant that you had less time to work on the necessities. Consequently, the Sulpicians needed money. And so they were frequently pressing the French monarchy for more and more access to the territory granted to the Genyenga Haga, which was something of a trade hub. The king's regent, Philippe d'Orléans, finally agreed to extend their claim without informing the Genyenga Haga a few years after their arrival, on the condition that they build a stone tower within two years. European powers seem to have felt that stone towers were not only sick, but they confirmed land claims. The Sulpicians were unable to build the tower, and so they asked for an extension to seven years. The extension was granted, and they failed again. So this plan to extend their territory should have been dead in the water, right? Well, no. The Sulpicians just started acting like they had rights over the territory, and they justified their encroachment into Kinesitage as in the interest of the souls of the community. This was a mission, after all. Over the years, completely counter to the spirit of the original agreement, the Sulpicians would sell plots of land of Genesatage to incoming French settlers. As late as the 19th century, the Sulpicians would even charge the Genyenga Haga with theft if they cut down trees for firewood without permission. Something that could mean the difference between life and death in the cold Quebec winters. The idea that this was a mission meant to be in service of the people of Genesatage was really just a conceit that served to conceal the fact that the territory was being progressively exploited and taken away from the Genyenga Haga. This relationship seemed like it might be on the way to improving when in 1763 the British conquered the colony of New France. Although widely seen as a catastrophic moment for, in particular, Quebec sovereigntists, it seemed like it might be the moment that would resolve some of the confusion that had been developing over the 60 years of sharp dealings at Genesatage, specifically when the British issued the Royal Proclamation of 1763. And pay attention here, folks. Because in spite of the horrifically boring title of the Royal Proclamation of 1763, 
Why that accent? This document would define the relationship between Canada and Indigenous people up until, well, up until today. The proclamation lays out the ground rules for a specific relationship between British colonies in North America and Indigenous people. It says specifically, and whereas it is just and reasonable and essential to our interest and the security of our colonies, that the several nations or tribes of Indians with whom we are connected and who live under our protection should not be molested or disturbed in the possession of such parts of our dominions and territories as, not having been ceded to or purchased by us, are reserved to them or any of them, as their hunting grounds. So, to be clear, this is still the doctrine of discovery. This is still, this is crown land, not yours, but you can use it. However, what we also have here is a declaration that any place that has not been ceded to, that is, given over officially to the crown, is guaranteed to the nations or tribes of indigenous people. As a bit of a side note, this is actually the first place in Canadian law that you see the term First Nations being used. And so when you hear the term First Nations, although it's come to be seen as something of an identity as well, it's also a specific reference to the Royal Proclamation of 1763. It's a call to honor the promises laid out in this document. I had a real butthead of a professor. Yeah, I called him a butthead. Fight me. I had a professor in university who thought that because he was smart about Aristotle, he also understood indigenous issues with like zero actual knowledge about them. He once said in class, apropos of nothing, but like nation is a European concept, so they can't even be First Nations owned. That's literally not what we're talking about. <sighs> Ever since I learned about the Royal Proclamation, I have replayed telling him about it so many times in my head. Yes, I know, I'm pathetic. Anyways, the Royal Proclamation, the Ro Pro, is a really big deal because, you know, like a lot of lands in Canada are covered by it. Like pretty much all land outside of modern Quebec. But at the same time, this isn't a straightforward declaration that all of these lands belong to First Nations, right? Again, doctrine of discovery. Like it's, it's all theirs, but not actually, right? It's the kings reserved for them under his protection. In effect, what's happening here is indigenous people are being made subjects of the crown. It's in a different way from how settlers are subjects of the crown, but they are subjects nonetheless. They hold their land of the king, at the king's pleasure, not on their own terms, and definitely not as sovereign nations in their own right. Today, this precedent produces its own kind of legal complexity because many indigenous communities in what would become Canada were actually sovereign nations. And so today they have to play this strange game of working within the strictures of the Royal Proclamation and later the Indian Act, all the while affirming their status as sovereign nations. Yet another layer is added on top of it with the specific language of lands not ceded because whatever you want to think about the ethics of it, the British never waged an outright war of conquest against First Nations like they did in the United States. They used policy and sharp dealings to push them aside instead. The Canadian way! Consequently, unlike the situation south of the border, no lands in Canada have actually been ceded. This is why, if you've ever heard a land acknowledgement, people refer to the unceded territory of the Algonquin or the Anishinaabe or whoever. All right, I keep doing this, but what does this have to do with the people of Gennesatage? With the conquest of New France, we have a Protestant power, the British, ruling over a Catholic province. I won't bore you with the details here, at least not about this, but suffice it to say that the British were not down with the Catholics. Specifically, it was not possible for Catholics to hold property in Great Britain, and the Sulpicians were nothing if not Catholic. 
shut your pie holes and your goddamn kids. What are you doing? So what does this mean for land granted to the Catholic boys by the King of France? Well, right after the conquest, the new colonial administrator, James Murray, guaranteed the Ganyinga Haga free exercise of their religion, customs, and trade with the English. And it seemed as though the Sulpicians' claim to the land would not survive the conquest. Great. Awesome. Oh, it could have been so simple. Well, not so fast. You see, the governors of New France, now renamed Quebec, quickly realized that making Catholicism effectively illegal would do nothing to shore up their position in North America. After having waged an expensive war that led to the capture of New France, the British had zero interest in stoking up resentments that might lead to a revolt. And so instead, what they did was what all colonial powers do, going back to the Romans. And that is, enter into a partnership with the elites to, in effect, downsource keeping the plebs in line. Beginning a tradition that would last up until the 1960s, so 200 years, the British entered into a partnership with the Catholic Church, which ensured the obedience of the people of Quebec. You can keep being Catholic as long as rebellions keep not happening. And so for Genesetage, this meant the Sulpicians were there to stay. And in spite of their claims being legally protected by the crown, they would continue to be slowly chipped away at over the centuries. The doctrine of discovery, sanctified by the British conquest and shored up by the relationship between the colonial administration and the Catholic Church, would mean that Ganesa Tage would prove to be a legal and moral nightmare for years to come. A few years back, I was living in Sudbury, Ontario. I was there taking some additional courses in French and Canadian history at Laurentian University. Poor, poor Laurentian. Anyways, it was an important time for me being exposed to First Nations people and ideas. Laurentian had, for reasons I won't go into here, it's no longer the case, but Laurentian had a really strong connection with the local Anishinaabe community, with history courses and even language classes taught by Anishinaabe people. I also participated in a day-long workshop called Men for Boys. Yes, I know, lame name, but that's okay. The idea was that boys from local elementary schools would be paired with an older mentor, and we would, I don't know, we would talk about our feelings. We talked about what it meant to be a man in the world today and kind of gave them a snapshot of the challenges they might face. The whole activity, the whole day, was lent a kind of seriousness, even sacredness, by Anishinaabe ceremony. We had an Anishinaabe singer introduce, punctuate, and conclude the day's activities. And we also had an Anishinaabe man come and share with us his experience of being a man. And one of the things that really stuck with me that he said, especially in the context of all the Anishinaabe ceremony that pervaded the day, was that for him, reconnecting with traditional knowledge and traditional culture saved his life. I won't go into the details of what he said because I couldn't find out who he was and so I couldn't ask permission. But suffice it to say, ceremony became for him a kind of bedrock, an anchor in the rough waters of life. Incidentally, I do think that ritual and a kind of serious magic is missing from our daily lives. Regardless, a reforging of a connection to traditional knowledge and traditional culture is something that you'll see a lot of in many indigenous communities across the country in Canada today. It's something that was literally made illegal by successive Canadian governments. I'm looking at you, Laurier and MacDonald. It was something that the government explicitly tried to kill through, for example, the residential school system. If you're interested in that story in particular, I'm not sure I'm the one to share it, at least not yet, but I've left some links in the description for more information. At any rate, the reforging of a connection to traditional culture and knowledge is something that very much animated the resistance at Ganesatage during the Oka crisis. During the 1970s in particular, the Ganyenga Haga had begun to recommit themselves to traditional knowledge and traditional culture through a political and spiritual philosophy known as the Longhouse. 
Since this was such an important part of the resistance that took place in 1990, I thought we'd take a look at that idea now. So you might, if you're in the know, have heard the name Hiawatha before, or Hiawatha. There is a poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, dropped in 1855. What have I become? The poem is not about the actual Hiawatha that we're talking about, but it's one of the reasons why the name might not be totally alien to everyone. Anyways, so there's this guy, Hiawatha, and he is credited with spreading the great law of peace among the Haudenosaunee in and around the 15th century, so just before contact with Europeans. Why should we care about this, you may ask? Well, the Haudenosaunee are our good friends, the Ganyangahaga. Well, sort of. So as I've already said like twice, the Ganyangahaga is the actual name for the Mohawks. Stay with me. And the Mohawks slash Ganyangahaga are a part of the Iroquois Confederacy. Maybe you heard of these guys. Well, the actual name of the Iroquois Confederacy is, drumroll, the Haudenosaunee. Do you have it? So the Ganyangahaga, or Mohawks, are one of the five, later six, nations of the Iroquois Confederacy, also known as the Haudenosaunee. How does this connect to everything? Well, the meaning of the Haudenosaunee is the people of the Longhouse. And so the Ganyangahaga are also the people of the Longhouse. Okay, but what is the Longhouse? It's not actually as straightforward as you might think. Why would it be? Well, firstly, it is an actual long house, right? It refers to large multifamily dwellings, a fancy word for house, organized around the female line of descent where the people of the long house lived. But it is also so much more. It's also a spiritual and political philosophy based around the teachings of Hiawatha and his mysterious friend known as Deganawida, or the Peacemaker. So in the 15th century, or rather the years leading up to the 15th century, the Haudenosaunee were constantly at war with each other, and it seemed like things were pretty much going to stay like that forever. Folks were feuding with each other, crushing skulls, and it had become to some extent a way of life, that is, until Deganawida arrived. His origins are ultimately a little mysterious. He may be more of a kind of stand-in for the long process of arriving at the political settlement known as the Great Law of Peace. The story goes that he came to the territories of the five nations which would become the Haudenosaunee, just south of Lake Ontario, from just north of Lake Ontario. And he came with knowledge of a new way to live in peace. There, Deganawida met Hiawatha, and although Hiawatha didn't trust him at first, he soon came to see the wisdom of his new ways. And after years of adventures together and proving the value of their new way of life, he helped him spread his teachings. If anybody's familiar with the story of Gilgamesh and Enkidu, it's a lot like that, actually. And so, to cut a long story short, the five nations, including the Ganyangahaga, would join together under the Great Law of Peace to form the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Under the Great Law of Peace, the Haudenosaunee drew up a contract to confirm the new order, or rather, they made what is called the Hiawatha Wampum Belt. Wampum belts are a kind of belt made with shells to confirm treaties by indigenous people across North America. Maybe in South America too, if you know, please uh, say so in the comments. Today, the belt's design is still used as the flag of the still existing Haudenosaunee Confederacy. You may have seen it. The figures on the wampum represent the five nations of the Haudenosaunee united by the white roots of peace. These roots themselves represent the main principles or philosophies of the Haudenosaunee way of life. So soundness of mind and body, justice and law for all equally, and the importance of military power to protect the Confederacy and also to enforce the great law of peace. In the center is a pine tree, the tree of peace. And if you'll remember, the Ganyangahaga of Ganesatage were trying to protect an area of their territory known as the Pines. The central pine tree represents not only the central Onondaga nation, geographically speaking, but also the heart 
of the nation. The idea of the Hiawatha Wampum is that all of the parts of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy are separate political unities, but they are also joined together to form one larger political unity. The five nations are a confederacy, which means that each part governs itself, but they also accept a larger overarching governance for everyone. Ultimately though, and this is important, the Haudenosaunee people themselves are considered to be the true source of power in this society. It's a representative form of governance where the chiefs are meant to represent the people and enact their will. Decisions are not made by royal fiat, but by consensus. Sound familiar? It's actually a really important development politically for the world. Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson apparently visited the Confederacy prior to drafting the US Constitution. And given the literally revolutionary contents of that Constitution, it's generally agreed upon that the Great Law of Peace had an important impact on the kind of participatory federalism that we have now in the United States. It's also worth mentioning that Canada is also a confederation in which its members, the provinces, hold specific powers where the federal overarching government holds different ones. And strictly speaking, neither is supposed to interfere in the domains of the other. The Haudenosaunee Confederacy is therefore the precursor to the democracies that we have in North America today. I suppose that fact is not particularly important for this video, but it's still kind of interesting, right? Anyways, if you are enjoying this video, I'd really appreciate it if you took a moment to like and subscribe. It really helps me get my videos out to as many people as possible. What's important about the Great Law of Peace for us are, roughly speaking, three things. The role of the clan mothers, the integrity of the confederacy, and the warrior society. Starting with the clan mothers, I've already discussed how the longhouse as a building itself was organized around the women of the community. The Haudenosaunee are a matrilineal society, meaning that descent is traced through women and women hold a lot of political power. Now, this has been confused to some extent by the impacts of the Indian Act. And whoa, baby, if you want to see a piece of legislation without any semblance of an attempt to serve the people it's meant to serve, and even that's being a little too kind, take a look at Canada's Indian Act. Definitely an important topic, but for now, one for another video. The point is that women are traditionally an important part of Haudenosaunee society, and this was only confirmed by the Great Law of Peace. It's the clan mothers, for instance, who not only chose the nine longhouse chiefs, the leaders of the Haudenosaunee confederacy, but also groomed them for those roles. Furthermore, the clan mothers not only have the right, but they have the responsibility to depose chiefs, to dehorn them as it's called, if they are either incompetent or acting against the best interests of the Confederacy. In short, women are central figures. In 1990, women would be the negotiators and the spokespersons, particularly in the figure of Ellen Gabriel. They are also defenders of the land, and it was almost exclusively women at the barricade on July 11th as the front loader advanced and tear gas canisters exploded around them. The second part of the Great Law that's particularly relevant is the integrity of the Confederacy. And in some ways, it's the most straightforward. Basically, the Haudenosaunee are one people, united by this law. The most immediate consequence of this is that should one part of the Confederacy be attacked, the rest are compelled to come help. In 1990, this meant that many other communities would come directly to the aid of Gnesetage, or, in some cases, start their own protests across the country. This is why on July 11th, the nearby reservation of Ganawage would occupy the Mercier Bridge. Another part of this integrity of the Haudenosaunee is that membership is pretty exclusive. Not like Hot Club, Jeff Bezos, Velvet Dress, Space Marine, Kim Kardashian exclusive, but like exclude people exclusive. I guess Jeff Bezos and Kim Kardashian exclude people too. Specifically, you are Haudenosaunee, and that means you are not something else. You don't get to belong to another political community that is not part of the Haudenosaunee. There is no dual citizenship. In practical terms, you lose all inheritance rights, birth rights, whatever. The moment you, in the words of the great law of peace, submit to the law of a foreign people. 
This is perhaps best expressed by another wampum. Remember, that's a Haudenosaunee contract that the Haudenosaunee drew up when they first encountered the Dutch. It's known as the two-row wampum. And the two-row wampum has two rows, right? And each of these two rows represents a single canoe, which in turn symbolizes the Europeans and then the Haudenosaunee. Basically, what we have here is a promise agreed to by the Haudenosaunee, and in this case the Dutch, that neither side will attempt to step into the canoe of the other. Doing so, and if you've ever been on a canoe, you can probably see the logic here, would capsize both canoes. Basically, the idea of the two-row wampum is you do you, we'll do us. In short, a pillar of Haudenosaunee life is the rejection of external interference. You can imagine then what the Ganyangahaga of Ganesetage may have felt for over 270 years. Lastly, we have arguably the most consequential aspect of the Great Law of Peace, as really one of the elements that would catapult Haudenosaunee traditionalism into the mainstream among modern Haudenosaunee, the Warrior Society. You may have seen the now ubiquitous flag of the Warrior Society. So remember how before the Great Law of Peace, the Haudenosaunee really liked killing each other, like a lot? Kind of reminds me of classical Greece. And actually, Ben Franklin called the Haudenosaunee the Romans of the New World. Well, the Great Law of Peace didn't change the fact that Haudenosaunee society, when it wanted to, could still be pretty warlike. The Great Law just transmuted that energy from feuding amongst themselves into external warfare. One part of the Great Law of Peace explains how the Confederacy could be extended to other groups. Yay! Peace on Earth! Not so much. If they didn't want to join, it was totally fine to just conquer them, and make them join. And so what does this mean for the warrior society? Warfare was important, and it was particularly important to the most aggressive and capable warriors of the Haudenosaunee, the keepers of the Eastern Door, those who we know as the Ganyengahaga, or the Mohawks. As for the warrior society, I am being a little bit sneaky here. The Warrior Society as such is really the name of something that would appear in the 20th century. During the time of the Great Peace, the warriors were simply that. They were, for all intents and purposes, the soldiers, meant to, according to the philosophy of the Great Law of Peace, protect the Confederacy and enforce its laws. In the 20th century, however, the Warrior Society would evolve into something new. Well, new-ish. Around 1980. A man called Louis Hall, who incidentally designed the warrior flag that we saw earlier, wrote a book called Rebuilding the Iroquois Confederacy. It was a radical book that took the great law of peace and distilled it into a political ideology that could be used to, well, rebuild the Iroquois or Haudenosaunee Confederacy. In the super influential book called People of the Pines by Laureen Pindera and Jeffrey York, they described the great law of peace as prescribed by Louis Hall as forming the basis of a modern theocracy. It is a rule book for everything from how to run schools to how to wage war, all based on the Haudenosaunee way of thinking. Now, the degree to which Hall's ideas actually defined the warrior society are a matter of debate. Joe Diem, a Ganyangahaga warrior who participated in the Oka crisis, said, His books aren't a driving force, they're more of a mirror. The idea being that the warriors were already something substantive, which Louis Hall merely described. Regardless, what's important for us is the fact that, whatever the ideas of the warrior society, their very presence and the popularity of their ideas marked the full expression of a process that had been taking place for the last 50 years. Namely, the decision on the part of indigenous people to look back to their own past as a source of inspiration for their future. The great law of peace would form a bedrock for a renewed commitment to the ways of being that had been progressively eroded by the Sulpicians and, of course, the government of Canada. And those who made a commitment to those ways of being would be called the adherents of the Longhouse.
It's important to keep in mind when talking about the siege of Genesetage, also known, of course, as the Oka Crisis, that this was not just some random explosion of rage. As we've seen already, the Ganyengahaga of Genesetage had been trying to get their land claims recognized since pretty much the very first day that they landed on the shores of the Lake of Two Mountains. And more than that, they did so in most cases, not through armed conflict, but by playing the game of the colonizers. Especially after the British conquest, they petitioned the government about once every 10 years, in one case even sending a delegation to Great Britain. I actually had a whole section on the life and struggles of Joseph Onasakenrad, who led the people of Genesetage to what amounted to the first Oka crisis. But for the sake of time, I had to cut it. If you're interested in that part, let me know by email and I'll send you a transcript of that section. Regardless, the point is just that even when playing the colonizer's game, the Ganyenga Haga were always rebuffed. Why do you think that might be? Does it rhyme with Taitbu Brempati? Does it rhyme with Mike Supremacy? <laughs> Anyways, the management of the territory by the Sulpicians went completely unchecked as they gradually whittled away more and more of the original three leagues given to Genesetage. And then the Sulpicians themselves just left. They had been experiencing financial troubles of their own, and so they sold their lands to a wealthy Belgian baron in 1936. Unsurprisingly, he was interested in developing the territory, and to whatever extent possible, excluding the Ganyengahaga. Actually, let's restate that. I don't think he ever thought about Genesetage at all at least not when he was originally making the purchase. And that's really the problem here, isn't it? It's the mindset of the doctrine of discovery. Also, doesn't it say a lot that the Sulpicians could just peace out? Like what about their responsibility to the souls of the people of Genesetage? It was always about the land and its value, never about the people. For Empain and the Sulpicians and the French and the British afterwards, the people of Genesetage and their claim to that land both before and after the actual land grant were immaterial. And like, this is the problem, right? <laughs> to put it as straightforwardly as possible, this is not a sustainable situation. Acting for all intents and purposes, like people don't exist, like the history of a place doesn't exist, doesn't stop those things from existing. Doing so will make you confused and maybe even angry at the people that remind you of these non-things. And so, after finding it was too much of a hassle to develop these lands, with the Ganyengahaga constantly reminding him of their existence by disrupting development, often at the expense of their own health and the threat of jail, it should be added, Enpin would sell the land once again to the town of Oka in 1950. By 1959, so 31 years before 1990, the town of Oka would approve the construction of the famous golf course. And guys, like, look how mediocre this place is. Like, the fact that this thing was the catalyst for a national crisis has got to tell you something, right? The golf course was approved to be built on an area of Genesetage known as the Commons, or to the Ganyengahaga, the Pines. And at the time, it should be mentioned, there was a huge outcry and there were protests. By 1990, only 31 years later, the people of Oka had completely forgotten that for the Ganyengahaga, this golf course was a problem. Turning to the pines themselves for a second, it's difficult to overstate their importance to the people of Genesetage. They had actually planted the pines in that area themselves in order to stabilize the hillside. Remember, the name Genesetage means where the crusty sand dunes are because, well, that's where the crusty sand dunes are. And what do crusty sand dunes do? They fall. They don't, they, sliding action takes place when they're on top of a hill, like this was. And the presence of the pine trees on this hill actually protects the town of Oka from landslides. Golf course greens, I probably don't have to tell you, would not have the same effect. We also shouldn't forget the importance of pine trees for the Haudenosaunee more generally. Remember that the white roots of peace 
unifying the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Hiawatha Wampum are those of a central pine tree. But it's also not just about pine trees. It's about a graveyard, which to this day still borders the Oka Golf Course. A chapter in the book, The People of the Pines, the definitive account of the Oka Crisis, which describes this place, is called Golf Balls Among the Headstones, because that is the reality of building a golf course literally right next to a graveyard. Like, look at this. Buried here are the remains of the people of Ganesatage going back centuries. The Oka Golf Course in 1990 already on lands the Ganyangahaga considered to be theirs, was going to be expanded, and so would completely envelop the graveyard and destroy a significant section of the pines. And the decision to do so was made explicitly without any thought for the people of Ganesatage. Jean Wallet, mayor of Oka in 1990, explaining why he didn't talk to them, said simply, you know you can't talk to the Indians. <sighs> do you? Do you? Do you know that? Regardless, he knew he had the strict rule of the law on his side. The ownership of the lands of Genesitage had never been settled. And anyways, they had somewhere to live, right? It looked like this would just be one more chapter in same old, same old for Genesitage. And yet we know that that's not what happened. Two things had changed. Firstly, the warrior society. Through force of arms and a barricade, the people of Ganesatage were able to make their case heard. But secondly, the people of Ganesatage also had the support of white settlers. For some reason, the white settlers were not indifferent to the struggles of the Ganyangahaga. Had something changed? Or was it the starkness of prioritizing an exclusive golf course over a graveyard? At the council meeting where the expansion was simply declared a fait accompli, some citizens of Oka were aghast. A petition signed by 900 demanded that the expansion not take place, whether because of an interest in the justice of the situation, or because, after all, this was a private membership golf course. Public opinion was, possibly for the very first time, split on the issue of appropriating the lands of Genesatage. When, on July 11th, 1990, as the tear gas canisters began to fall, Ellen Gabriel shouted out, This is their justice system? What the f kind of people are they? Over a goddamn golf course and their f***ing greedy lust for money? She may have had little sense of the degree to which many Canadians would absolutely agree. In the days that followed the beginning of the Oka crisis, the worst parts of settler culture would be expressed. On the one hand, the SQ, that's the provincial police force, had a history of pretty extreme violence toward the Ganyangahaga, and the Oka crisis would be no exception. Without going into too much detail, let's put it this way. Once the Canadian army was called in to replace the SQ, many Ganyangahaga breathed a sigh of relief. On the one hand, this was because with the federal army as their adversary, some Ganyangahaga felt that their nation-to-nation -nation claims were granted legitimacy. On the other hand, the Canadian army showed a lot more restraint than the SQ, especially in the context of the death of Corporal Marcel Lemay. This manifested in several ways. For instance, they attempted to starve out the Ganyangahaga, particularly the ones who were blockading the Mercier Bridge. Access to food and medicine was restricted. Moreover, those who simply looked Mohawk would be stopped, and in some cases, literally tortured in order to elicit a confession to their participation in the standoff. Alanis Abomsawin's excellent documentary about these events, which you should definitely watch, link in the description, has an interview in which a man and his son, with zero connection to the events going on at the barricade, were stopped and threatened. During the encounter, a police officer accidentally discharged his weapon, thankfully, into the ground, spraying the two with dirt. The way the man involved fights off tears is disturbing. But the SQ weren't the only ones that Ganyangahaga had to worry about. The small suburb of Chateau Gay, which sits to the southwest of Montreal, was the settler community which was probably the most impacted by the crisis. The Ganyangahaga of Ganawage had also seized the Mercier Bridge in solidarity with their brothers and sisters at Ganesatage. And so Chateau Gay was effectively cut off from Montreal, where many of its citizens worked. Rioting broke out in the streets of Chateau Gay 
which the SQ also attempted to contain, and which culminated in the burning of an effigy of a Ganyangahaga person. The sign on his shirt says, Savage. Later on during the crisis, when some of the citizens of Ganawage attempted to leave the reserve, fearing escalation, the citizens of Chateau Gay lined up along their route, and egged on by radio hosts, they threw rocks at the cars as they drove past. One Ganyangahaga man in his 70s died shortly after from a heart attack, thought to have been caused by the stress of the attack, when a large rock burst through the window and hit him in the chest. The SQ officers were present, but did nothing to stop what was happening. We've already discussed the philosophical basis for the warrior society, so I won't go into it again here. But it is true that the warrior society was more than just present at Oka. While it was the women who were manning the barricade on July 11th, it was the men, the warrior society, who were staked out in the woods with AK-47s. And it was their gunfire which, it seems, had caused the death of Corporal Marcel Lemay. And the warrior society, at this time, were not angels. It's clear that criminal activity was a part of the financing of the warrior society. Many warriors were veterans of the Vietnam War, and many of the warriors at Ganesatake did not come from there. They came from Aquasasni and elsewhere. But the distinction made by some of the citizens in Chateau Gay between the Ganyangahaga and the warrior society were false. Remember that according to the great law of peace, members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy are bound to come to each other's aid. And so when Ganesatage put out the call for aid shortly before July 11th, many answered. So terrorists? I actually talked about the concept of terrorism in my last video on the FLQ. And so if you'd like a more in-depth treatment of the topic, you can click the link that should be popping up here. But to my mind, and to that of many Canadians, the presence of these men with their guns and their masked faces didn't make them terrorists in this situation. The hundreds of years of dealing with the government on their own terms had yielded no results. As Shiri Pasternak of the Yellowhead Institute says, Canada has only ever listened to us when we blockade and when we protest. The SQ was prepared to inflict whatever damage on the people of Ganesatage over the expansion of a golf course. A golf course, people. So does that mean that violence is in some way justified? Am I saying that the death of Marcel Lemay was A-OK? -okay? Obviously not. At the same time, the combination of systemic exclusion and explicit policies of assimilation, which, let's be frank, amount to genocide, has to lead somewhere, right? The two-row wampum, remember that? What happens when you stick your foot in two canoes at once? The siege of Ganesatage ended on the terms of the Ganyangahaga. After 78 days, the Canadian army pressed in closer and closer. They would use tactics such as shining lights on the protesters at night to keep them awake, or launching flares, or turning the power on and off at the reserve. The protesters were never sure if a great push were coming today, tomorrow, next week. No more deaths resulted from these tactics, but the psychological impact shouldn't be understated. After 78 days, the Ganyangahaga decided to leave their position in the pines, marching out peacefully and unarmed. Doing so was a bit of a surprise to the Canadian Army, and in the botched response, 14-year-old Juanique Horn Miller was stabbed by a Canadian soldier. She survived her injuries, but it was an ignominious end. I think what was shocking about the Oka crisis, the siege of Ganesatage to many, was that it was political violence taking place in normally peaceful Canada. A confrontation like this, an essentially military confrontation, hadn't taken place in Canada in more than a hundred years. Incidentally, that earlier confrontation was also between Canada and Indigenous people, or at least the Métis during the Red River Resistance. Oka was surprising to Canadians, and to Quebecers in particular. We were a peaceful country. The world's nice guys. We didn't have these kinds of problems. And yet, it was for the simple reason that then, as today, Canada is incomplete. 
the place of indigenous people in Canada is not properly defined. Genesetage is probably one of the more drastic examples, with no clear land claims being established, even now. But that doesn't mean that the reserve system is fair either. The Indian Act, while apparently a part of our constitution, is not meant to include indigenous people in governance. It's meant to exclude them until they magically become white people. Now, to be clear, I am not even advocating the removal of the reserve system. The history of Canada's relationship with Indigenous people has been one of removing more and more and more rights. I think we need to at last realize that this has been a resounding failure, and a failure which has come at the expense of the well-being of Indigenous people. New thinking is demanded. And I'm happy to say that there are movements which are promising. The land back movement, which is not what you think, is not about putting white folks on boats and sending them back to Europe. The land back movement argues that constitutional change is needed. Indigenous people need to be partners in Canada, just as provinces are. Canada, as it stands now, is incomplete. The fathers of confederation forgot something forgot someone very important in this country. And it's time for us, for our generation, to finish the job. Well, thanks for watching, folks. This has been quite a video to make. The ideas are big and the stakes are even higher. And I'm curious to know what you think about it, about all of this. Do you think there is a way forward for Canada and Indigenous people? Maybe I missed something important or glossed over something that needs more explaining. Do you have your own experience of the siege of Genesetage or the Oka crisis? Leave your thoughts in the comments and don't forget to like and of course subscribe to the channel for more. You can also follow me on Twitter at a few acres. My next project at this point probably going to be on the Constitution of Canada, but I'm also very much open to suggestions. This is now two videos about crisis and political resistance, so maybe a series is in order. Thanks for watching. I'm Tristan.